logic and computation, a match made in heaven. When I look at computer science, but computing, I see three legs. One leg, which is a more theoretical and conceptual leg, is algorithms. That's the, the, the critical component of what we do in computer science. I call them computational problem solving recipes. But algorithms are living in platonic space. To make them run in the real world, we first need programs, which are executable descriptions of algorithms. And we need systems, which are physical platforms on which we execute these programs. So these are the three legs of computing. Then foundation of computer science, so theoretical computer science should be the theoretical study, the theory of algorithms and programs and system. And if you look at early Stock and Fox proceedings, you will see that really they had a very, very broad coverage. And through a socio-technical uh, process, they have somewhat, the field is too large today, maybe to cover all in one, in two conferences. So today, Stock and Fox are focusing mostly on the theory of algorithms and computation complexity. And I'll come back uh, to this point towards the very end. My research is still trying to span kind of the three legs, and I will describe it as the theoretical synergy between algorithms and their description with applications to systems. Given the more limited time we have today, I will not be able to talk about uh, systems, but I will talk about algorithm and their description. And to talk about this, about their description, I'm going to go back, uh, you know, 150 years, more than 150 years to a small book called Begriffschrift, Language for Concept, published by Friedrich Ludwig Gottlob Frege, in, in which you introduce for the first time what he considered to be the language of mathematics. Yeah, the question that adre is addressed in the book is, what is the language of mathematics? And Frege says, well, all mathematical discourse is about mathematical objects, maybe numbers, relationship between them, predicates, operations, operations on them, Boolean operations, which is what people thought of logic for 2000 years, more than 2000 years, but also the new discoveries of the 19th century quantifiers for all and, and there exist. And the term first order logic emerged later in the 20th century, and if we can talk more about that, but essentially these elements are what today we would consider to be the elements of first order logic. So just to give you a very concrete example, I will talk about graphs. So we can say something like the node X has at least two distinct neighbors. So there exists Y and Z and not, not equal, Y is not equal to Z and edges from X to Y and edges from X to Z. So at X has two distinct neighbors. An important thing here that X is a, what we call a free variable. It's a generic variable. So you cannot ask whether this uh, formula is true in a graph without binding X to a concrete value. And that's, a, that's an assignment. And we write it as the graph satisfies with, with this binding a formula phi of x. We can also uh, talk about, about each node has at least two distinct neighbors. Now we say for all x there exist y and z. And now this is a sentence and this will have a, it will express a property of a graph and we write it g and the double terms I mean satisfaction, g satisfies the property phi. So this is the first, first order logic on graphs. Um, the, model, the model theory is, we talk about a sentence satisfying or not satisfying a graph. So the set of models of psi is a set of graph satisfying the sentence. And so logic gives us a way to describe classes of graphs, or classes of mathematical structures. And model theory, which is part of mathematical logic, is the, this meta theory of mathematical modeling, studying the modeling power of logic. But in 1970, Ted Codd published an influential paper in which he said beyond the modeling power here, formulas define queries. How do, how do formula define queries? When we look at the formula phi with k free variable applied to the graph G, what we are getting there, we look at all the assignments to this tuple of variable that satisfy the formula on this graph. And so the, what we get is a set of assignment, a set of tuples, and that's the answer that you get from the query. 
So to take something very simple, if we take the formula that says X has two distinct neighbors, we can think of it as a query that tells us, give us all the X's that have two distinct neighbors. So first order formulas in first order logic describe queries. And there was a whole project that ended up with the standardization of SQL and converted first order logic to a concrete query language for that databases. Also sentences where there are no free variable. These are yes or yes, no queries. These are just properties of structure or graph or structures. So the paper was in 1970. The, the, during the decade, there was two big projects, System R at IBM and Ingress at Berkeley. And the both led to the establishment of the relational database industry in the 80s. And the impact was, was, was recognized fairly quickly and code received within 11 years, he received the Turing Award. And there were two fundamental contributions there. One was realizing that a table, which we think is a visual way to represent data, is a mathematical relation. As a mathematical relation is a set of, is a set of uh, tuples. And here, typically, the observation is when you have a table, the order of the, of the rows doesn't matter. So it's really a set of rows, a set of tuples, and therefore it's a relation. And this was the starting point where you, you realize you can apply logic to it. Then the second part is the formulas are queries. And they specify the what rather than the how. So logic gives us an idea here of declarative programming. And the, and the insight that comes out of this work is an intimate connection between logic and algorithms. So let me dig a little bit deeper into this connection between logic and algorithms. And I will call it logical algorithmics. So what does logical alg algorithmics mean? So the standard algorithmic problem is we have a, let's say an input structure, let's say a graph, let's say the undirected graph. And we're interested, does it have a certain property? For example, is it three colorable? Does the graph, is the graph three colorable? So usually we start with some property in mind and we are going to check whether the structure satisfy the property. The logical perspective on it, that instead of some fixed property, we specify the property by means of a sentence in some logic. So now instead of asking, you know, just generally about the property, we're asking the following, is that we have a sentence phi to describe the property. And we use logic such as first order logic on finite structure Whenever you say there exists, there are finitely many elements that you enumerate, or if you say for all, there are finitely many elements. So generally we have logic is going to be decidable over finite structures. And therefore we have this perspective that, that uh, the, the property is true in the graph. If we have some uniform algorithm, I'll call it the quantitative, the, the, the query uh, evaluation algorithm. This is not quantitative easy, is query evaluation. The query evaluation is, gives us a way to evaluate, does the property hold? So, so now we are not just asking about specific property, but we have a very generic way to describe, to take properties in some logic and evaluate whether they hold for, this, for the structure or not. Now, until now, I kind of imply that first order logic is the right logic for these queries. But it turns out that first order logic may be too weak. For example, if you look at three colorability, it's not expressible in first order logic. Why is that? Because we need to say there exists coloring. And so in fact, we are going to do it in existential second order logic because it will say there exists, you quantify over relation. In the case of three coloring, I will quantify over, over unary relation, which are, are going to be the colors. So to exist to say there is a color red, I'm quantify over a subset of the nodes. So logical algorithmics is the study of algorithms where the problem we are studying are specified using logic. Now, this was, this is follow from 1970, but a few years later, Ron Fagan proved something called, we call, we call today Fagan theorem. And he proved that this uh, logic essential second order expressed precisely NP, precisely NP time. What does precisely mean? Every property in NP is, can be expressed by a sentence in existential second order. And every existential second order captures a property in NP. And this, this perfect match, perfect correspondence between existential second order ESO and NP 
is actually quite astounding because to define NP, we need to define notion of a Turing machine and, and we need to notion of steps and time and polynomial, a lot of machinery that we need before we get to the, to get to the class NP. And here we just says, well, anything expressible, any property expressible in, in, in sense second order is NP and it captures all of NP. So on one hand, it tells us that NP, there is something very, very fundamental in NP. It's not just this, this set of definition, but there is something very deep here. And it gives rise to a theory that become known as descriptive complexity theory. This is the first theorem in descriptive complexity theory that says that ESO equals NP time. So what is descriptive complexity theory? Is the theory of studying problems, but not from the perspective of how much, how much time or space is needed to solve them, but what is the complexity of the description of the problem? So it could be what logic is required to express the problem, or but how many variables are required, how many quantifiers are required, and the like. One easy consequence of a Fagan theorem is that if ESO captures NP, then full second order logic is precisely the polynomial hierarchy. So again, the polynomial hierarchy has a very, very close matching logic. It is precisely second order logic. Now this deep insight that there is a deep connection between the computational com complexity of problems and the descriptive complexity was first, I said, first came from Fagan theorem, but later the person who most, the, 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 the proponent of this, who developed this connection at most depth in Neil Immerman, and in fact, he published a book with the title Descriptive Complexity Theory. And I'll come back later to my own work where I did some work in descriptive complexity theory. So, so this is logical algorithmic. This is the basic connection between logic and algorithms. Now, remember I mentioned the core evaluation meta algorithm because it solves all properties expressible in a logic, for example, in first order logic. So to remind you, QE of a sentence phi and a, and a structure G is one precisely if the, if the structure satisfies the property. So in a stock 1982 paper, the main uh, question that I try to answer in that paper was what is the computational complexity of this meta algorithm Q? It's an algorithm. It takes a sentence and a structure and returns one or zero. And what is the complexity, the complexity of this algorithm? Well, it turns out that this is a bit tricky. Why? Because first of all, we should ask what logic, what logic should we use here? First order logic, existential second order, so, so first of all, we have to figure out what logic. This is one, one question here. The, the other issue here that this now we are QE, query evaluation, we are giving it two input variables. We have two input variables, the sentence phi and the graph G. So we have two separate variable. How do we take them into, into account? So Fagin theorem said that for each fixed sentence in ESO, the complexity is in NP time. But so you give you sentence by sentence, it corresponds to NP properties. But what happens if we are looking at, at, at the sentence as a variable other than a fixed sentence? So, so it turns out that this is actually very, the fact that we have two very different parameters is, is, is a problematic. We'll come back to it. But there were two questions. The first question was, remember, I, I want to say what logic? First, log, first order logic, essential second order logic. So surely we should study both first order logic and essential second order. Is that enough? When in 1979, Ehon Ullman said it's not enough. Ehon Ullman should be recognized for being the recipient of this year's Turing Award. In the 1979 paper, they show that the first order logic is not enough. In particular, it cannot express rough graph reachability. So following that, a year later, Chan and Arel defined a new logic, fixed point logic, which is first order logic with induction. And where's the fixed point here for the induction to terminate, we need to reach a fixed point. 
So it turns out that this gives us a simple hierarchy of three logic, first order logic, above it first order logic, and above it existential second order. So this is a strict hierarchy. So I will now consider these three logics. So this is one question we want to answer. What logic? We will, uh, we will look at three logic. The other logic one could consider, but I will focus here on first order logic, fixed point logic, and existential second order. The, the, the more subtle point is to how to measure complexity. So complexity theory look at scaling behavior. It asks how long or how much space does it take to solve a problem as a function of the input size. So here we have two parameters, two variables, the database size and the query size. So the, the total input size is the sum. So if I have a gigabyte, gigabyte size uh, or gigabit size uh, database, and the query is usually it's going to be maybe yeah big, so maybe 100 characters in a query, that's pretty good query. So, so the input size by the traditional approach is, is billion plus 100. So you almost tend to ignore the 100, right? You can almost round, round it off. But, but there are really two different variables here. What's going to be more challenging, doubling the size of the data or doubling the size of the query? And so it becomes, as more you think about it, it becomes very clear the database size and the query size play very, very different role. So by looking at just notion of input size, we are not taking into account the subtlety that we have two input variable and they play very, very different roles. So the paper from 82 developed a complexity theory for logical algorithmics. And the basic principle is we need to separate the influence of the data and the query on the running time, let's say, or on the space. How do we separate them? Well, if we want to look just at the impact of the query, let's fix the data. And if we want to understand just what is the impact of the, of the data, just fix the query. So we get two different ways to do that. And it turns out that this fixing the data or fixing the query actually correspond to real life scenarios of, day, of, of using data. So imagine that um, I'm a demographic researcher. So the, the 2020 census just uh, was completed recently. And now for the next 20 years, demographers will run different queries against the same data. The data will not change now for the next 10 years until we do the next census. So we have fixed data, varying query. On the other hand, think of a technical trader who's looking for some price arbitrage. And this trader may have one fixed query, but the data changes maybe every second. So you will run the same query again and again and again on variable data. And that correspond to, as we saw, that correspond to fixing the data or fixing the query. So what we get is a tale of two complexity. To study the query complexity, we fix the data. And so now we're looking at the, at the complexity of, of, of the decision problem for the following set. All the sentences in the logic L, this is for relative to logic L, all the sentences of logic L, such that when you do query evaluation of phi on B, and B is fixed here, the answer is one, the answer is yes. So the only thing that changes is the query, that's why we call it query complexity, it's equal, equivalent to also expression complexity. Data complexity is the other way, right? Now we have, we are fixing the sentence. We are fixing the sentence and we are evaluating now the data. We are changing the data complexity. So we have query complexity and data complexity. So now we have data complexity versus query complexity. And in the, the 1982 paper showed the exponential gap between data and query complexity. So let's look at the three logic, first order logic, fixed point logic, existential second order. For data complexity, you go from log space, NP, P complete and NP complete. Query complexity, you get P space complete, exponential time complete and next time complete. As you can see here, the exponential gap between data complexity and query complexity. So the theory here does justify the intuition that the query matters much more than the data. Data is kind of flat, doesn't have much structure. 
So if you increase the data, yeah, it should be polynomial increase or linear increase. But if you change the query, it will cost you dearly. And that's why we do query optimization because we need to take a query and try to get a shorter query that explain that express the same the same query. So this distinction between data and query, that's what we are seeing here. And it has very broad applicability because there are many situations where we, we, we find there is data and there is query. And we need to understand the relationship. What is the complexity of doing query evaluation according to these uh, parameters? We can also call it now the term that have become more popular is multivariate complexity theory because there are two variables here. But this gave rise to something that emerged only a, a few years later in the late in the late 80s. People start publishing the first papers on by Abramson et al. was about parameterized complexity theory. But but parameterized complexity theory as, was really foreshadowed by multivariate complexity theory. Here you can say that the query itself is a parameter. Typically in, in parameter complexity theory, you look at the maybe the length of the query is a parameter. But here we are saying that the, the query itself is a parameter and we have, this is give rise to multivariate complexity theory. Now, if we go back to the issue of descriptive complexity, then we saw that fixed point logic correspond to data complexity to polynomial time and the query complexity to exponential time, essential second order to NP time and next time. Fagin theory told us that existential second, existential second order equal NP. So we have a very tight matching between them. And then you ask yourself the question, you can ask it, okay, what is the, the precise relationship between FP and P time? And this was answered independently at the same year by Neil Emmerman and myself, which was that FP equal P time, but only over order structures. Um, so it's an analog of Hagen theorem, but you have the extra the requirement of order. And the major open question is, can we get rid of this assumption over ordered structure? What about P time on unordered structures? And this independently was posed by first by Chan and Arel and then a bit more polished by Gurevich. This is still very much an open question going back from the early eighties. We are now practically 40 years later, this question is still open. What about P time on unordered structures? Now, what I'd like to do now is take the lens of uh, this query and data complexity and apply it to a particular setting that's called the consent satisfaction problem. So consent satisfaction, we have a set of variable, a set of values, and a set of constraints. What is a constraint? It's a pair, a tuple of variables in a relation of the same R. And the idea is that when you assign values to these variables in the tuple, it has to be in that relation. So we are looking for an assignment H from V to D and such that we need that for each constraint T comma R, we need that H of T should be in R. So this, you can think of it as local consistency. And the, 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 to solve the problem, you need global consistency. You need all constraints to be satisfied. I will, I'll give an example in a minute. This is the way it usually phrased in the AI literature. And this is a very, very generic problem. And you find many, many instances of this in AI, in OR, in, in programming languages, all over the place. In some sense, you would say this is one of the most general. If you look, of course, we have NP, which is a kind of a general definition. But if you look at practical NP problem, thousands of them have this structure. Make an assignment to to variable of some values to variable subject to some constraint. So this is a very, very uh, common problem. You look at Gary and Johnson, you will not find it. But on our hand, you find many, many, many instances of this problem. Now, there is another problem that has been studied more by, by graph theorists and by, by logicians, and that's the homomorph, homomorphism problem. There you're given two structures, A and B, and each structure is a domain and a tuple of relations. And the two structures have the same vocabulary. And what we mean by that, the arities of the relation must match. And homomorphism is a mapping from the domain A to, the, to B, from A to B, 
and it has to map every tuple in a relation Ri of A into the relation Ri of B. So every tuple in A has to map into, into some tuple in B. And the homomorphism problem asks, is there such homo homomorphism? Now I'll give a very concrete example. A graph, a graph A, V, E is recolorable precisely if there's homomorphism from the graph into the, the complete graph on three nodes, into K3. And it's easy to see that every edge in A has to map into a pair of distinct colors in a, because, because K3 has no self loops. Again, there are many, many problems that are instances of, of homomorphism, K-click, Hamiltonian cycle, subgraph isomorphism, even reachability, many, many, many such problems. Homomorphism does show up in Gary, in Gary and Johnson. In Stock 93, Thomas Feder and I argued that CSP equal homomorphism. And what do you mean by, by equal? Of course, they're both NP-complete problems because they can both express NP-complete we can both express three colorability, let's say. But the reduction between them are so simple, they're just simple syntactical reduction that we say, well, it's really the same problem in two different sy syntaxes. So we declare them to be the same problem. Now, now we, we can take a look at the, at the, at the complexity of, of uh, CSP now. And again, now I will use CSP and homomorphism interchangeably. So the uniform CSP, you're given two structure A and B, and you're asked, is there homomorphism from A to B? And interestingly, this problem already shows up in Levine and the completeness paper from 1973. And so clearly you can express three, color three colorability. So this is NP complete. But I want to go back to the lens of query, the logic, logical, alg alg logical algorithmics. What, when you're asking for homomorphism for A to B, you're asking, is there a mapping can you find a copy of a homomorphic copy of A inside B? So A is a pattern and you're looking for that pattern inside your structure B. So that means we can think of A as the query and B as the, as the data. And you're asking, evaluate this query on the data. Tell me if you find a copy of, a, of the structure of A inside B. So now I will use the lens of data and query complexity. And that gives rise to two, what we call non-uniform problems. The fixed source, in the fixed source, we fix the query. So now we are doing data complexity. So we have a fixed graph A and we're asking, can you find a copy of A inside B? Uh, in fact, you can write it in first order logic, but because hey, here A is fixed, all you have to do is uh, just try all possibilities and you can do it in log space. You can in log space find the, 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 the images, check possible images of A inside B and check that the edges map. So this is a very, become very easy problem. So it's not very interesting. The fixed source CSP is not very interesting. It's trivially in log space. What happened if instead we look at the, at the, at the query complexity, that's we fix the data. So now we fix the target. So B is fixed and we're asking about on the only input is for a given A, does it map into B? So this is now the query complexity of non-uniform CSP. And now very quickly we discovered the answer is it depends. So if now remember B is fixed, take B to be K2, then this become two colorability. So this is in polynomial time. Take uh, B to be K3, this is not three colorability. So it's NP complete. So what it tells us that now the answer of what is the query complexity of CSP dot B depends on B. So the, the, the research program that Thomas Feder and I started in 1993 was let's understand this collection of problem. And in particular, we are looking all this uh, CSP dot B and we want to understand when is it tractable and when is it not tractable. And the conjecture we made in the paper is that there is a dichotomy that all such problems are either in P time or they're NP complete. Now, what's intriguing about it is you remember that, that uh, NP as a whole by Ladin theorem does not have a dichotomy. We have P time 
and we have NP complete, and we have a whole zoo, there are infinite, infinite million problems in between. And this says the conjecture is to this very, very large class of NP complete of NP problems, there is a dichotomy. There are no in-between problems. And part of the intuition was that uh, it takes some, you need some syntactical richness to diagonalize. Ladner proof is by then diagonalization. And CSP is too poor syntactically to be able to diagonalize. But the inspiration for that result, or what we call evidence in quote, inspiration would be the, really the, the better word, are two very classical results. One was a beautiful result by, by Helen Neshetrill from 1990. And they look at just undirected graphs. And they said there are just two cases here. If the target B, which is now fixed, is bi bipartite, then this is still essentially two coloring and therefore it's in P time. But if it's not bipartite, then it has an odd cycle and we can then reduce three coloring to it and therefore it's NP complete. So these are the two, that's it, the two cases, bipartite, non-bipartite, and we have a full classification as long as you're dealing with undirected graphs. Some years earlier, uh, Schaefer in stock 78 proved another dichotomy theorem. He looked at what happened when the target structures have a Boolean domain, just zero and one. And these are called so-called generalized satisfiability problem. For example, if you want to express two SAT, in two SAT you have a uh, closet that have two variables. So the two variable can be of the same polarity, positive, same polarity, negative, or different polarities. And this corresponds to three different relations that each one has three tuples satisfying X or Y, not X or Y, not X or not Y. And this is just one, one case. And Schaefer proved a dichotomy. He said, here are the cases where we have tractability. And I won't go and define each one of them, but it is the trivial case, horn, horn sat, anti-horn sat, disjunctive, which is a generalization of, of, of two sat, affine, which is run, uh, XORs. These are the tractable cases. All other cases are NP complete. So again, for Boolean CSP, we have dichotomy. For undirected graph CSP, we have a dichotomy. And that inspired Feder and, Feder, Thomas Feder and, 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 and I to make this conjecture that CSP has a dichotomy. Now, we try in trying to understand this dichotomy, and where does it sit? We try to understand better where does, where does CSP sit relative to all of NP? So remember that. Uh, 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 NP is existential second order by Fagin theorem. So it turns out that if you just look, if you try to express CSP in second order logic, you get a fragment of existential second order, which we call monadic monotone strict NP. And I won't go right now to define exactly. These are the three, these are syntactical restriction on existential second order, monotone, had to do with polarity, monadic had to do with arity, strict means you only have universal quantifiers. So this is a fragment. MM SNP is an obvious way to formalize CSP. It's more general than CSP, but it's obvious way to formalize it. What we did show is that it can be reduced to CSP. So if CSP has a, a dichotomy, so does MM SNP. Our reduction was randomized. Later on, other people managed to de randomize it. But if you drop any one of these condition, remember you have monotone, monadic, strict, three condition. If you drop any of them, then it's equivalent to NP and therefore it will not have a dichotomy. So we have almost in some sense kind of a very, the largest possible class in NP that could have a dichotomy. And on the other side, we ask how low can you pull it down? And we show that if you just resolve the, resolve the conjecture for directed graphs, that's enough to, to phrase it, to, to prove it for all structures. You can reduce all structures to directed graphs. Now, the other question we address in the paper was what is the source of tractability? So we actually look at the, at the literature. How do people solve CSP when they have tractable algorithm? How do they solve such problems? And there are now, there are only two algorithms out there. One is essentially what we call constraint propagation. So if you do, Sudoku is an example of a, of a CSP. And if you think, how do you do Sudoku? You don't use any number theory. I've never had anybody using the Riemann hypothesis 
to solve Sudoku. You just do, the, really the numbers one, the, the one to nine are just tokens and you're just doing consent propagation. In some setting that algebra, we call algebraic setting, we have like, if we have vector spaces, we have additional structural information and then we use Gaussian elimination. So Gaussian elimination is again concept propagation, but we can first diagonalize the matrix. It's something you cannot do generally. So the other conjecture in, at, uh, at that paper, the Stock 93 paper, that these are the only reason for tractability of CSP. When it's tractable, it will be either combinatorial or algebraic. These are the two, there are no other algorithm hiding somewhere because if there were, somebody would have found them by now. That was our intuition. Now, how does one go and attack this problem? So we do not solve, this was a conjecture. We did not solve it in 1993, but we had an idea of an attack. And our idea had to do with a little algebraic construction and the algebraic construction is, first of all, take two graphs, two directed graphs, let's say, I can define their product. How do you define the product? The node set is the product V1 cross V2. And the, the product of two edge relation is that there is an product edge from U, U prime to V, V prime, if both edges exist, U, V is an edge in E1 and, and U prime V prime is an edge in E2. So this is a notion of product of two graphs and you can generalize it to general to relational structure. You can make the product by, by the same way that a, a tuple require that all the, all the embedded tuples exist. Why is this a, an important operation? So we, we said, let's look at homomorphism from some power B to the K of the structure into B itself. Remember B is now this, the fixed target. We're looking for homomorphism from B to the K to B. And the intuition for such a carry homomorphism, which is called polymorphism, is that it's a closure operation on your set of constraints. Because you say, take K tuples, apply the operation on them. The new tuple will be again in the, in the structure. And an example of a theorem that you can, you can uh, prove is take a particular type of function, take what we call a KRE near unanimity operation. So it's a KRE function. It takes K argument, but if K minus one of them are equal to some A, then the output of the function must be A. So unanimity function will require all inputs to be A. Near unanimity allow for one exception. Majority of course is a simple, is a three RE near unanimity operation, okay? Three RE majority is a near unanimity operation. The, the, the 93 paper shows that if the polymorphism of B contains a near unanimity function, that's a sufficient condition for tractability, not only in P time, but we know that the combinatorial algorithms works for such problem. So what we said in the paper that it looks should be, it should be interesting to study more polymorphisms. In fact, we did not even have polymorphism but we looked at this closure property and we said, they seem to be relevant to the complexity. But this observation that polymorphisms are important was carried very far by Peter Givons from Oxford and his collaborators. So Peter Givons realized, we did not even know that these are studied in universal algebra. So universal algebra is a branch of model theory. Model theory, you look at the logical theories of mathematical structures. And universal algebra look at algebraic structures. So I don't interested in relations, only in functions. And polymorphism are the major topic of study in universal algebra. This is something that uh, Feder and I did not realize. Givons did realize it. And not only he start working on this, he brought in universal algebraists. I'll mention one of them. We're going to meet one of them in a few minutes. And one of the theorem they were able to prove together was that if you have two structure B1 and B2, and they have the same set of polymorphisms, then the, two, the CSP dot B1 and CSP dot B2 are polynomially equivalent. And it means if you want to understand the complexity, complex complexity of, of CSP dot B, you should study the polymorphisms. And so that observation that started with, with the observation was first made, the connection to complexity was made in the 93 paper and the fleshed out further by Givons and his collaborator that gave, gave rise to a program that lasted almost 25 years. And eventually it was resolved in 2017. 
and there were two uh, papers in uh, Fox 2017, why by, one by Andre Bulatov and the other one by Dimitri Zhuk. Uh, it turns out that universal algebra was a popular topic in, in Soviet Union and then in, in Russia. And using technique from universal algebra, they were able to show that dichotomy conjecture was correct. It's not a dichotomy theorem, but it's also an effective dichotomy in the sense that you can, it is, it is decidable, not tractable, but at least decidable given a structure at, at, at target B, whether the CSP dot B is in P time or in P complete. And if it's P time, you want to know, is it commentorial or algebraic? You can classify the two. So that research program that was launched in 1993 was finally concluded in 2017. But there are other aspects of CSP that are not necessarily algebraic. For example, there is something which we call the semi-uniform CSP. In semi-uniform CSP, we are looking at a class of sources, not, not, a, not a single source. Single source is always trivial, but what if we have a class of sources? For example, in database context, it's a class of queries. Well, a particular condition is a look at the core of the graph of a structure. The core of a structure is its unique minimal homomorphic substructure because all different homo homomorphic, all, all, un all minimal homomorphic substructures are going to be isomorphic to each other. And C, the class C sub K correspond to structure with, whose core has three weights at most K. So this is the class C sub K. And Dalmar Colaitis and, and myself were able to show in 2002 that CSP of CK dot is tractable. And in fact, it can be solved combinatorially. And the technique here is not algebraic. You use so-called logic game. These are called pebble game that are used a lot in, in, in logic. Turns out that this is essentially a tight result. First, Goy show that assuming under some, some parameterized complexity theoretic assumptions, this is the only time you get tractability is if you are in, if the core has bounded three widths. And then Atzerias, Bulatov, and Dalmau show that if you want to solve them combinatorially, then this is a strict lower bound with no assumption that the CSP A dot is solved combinatorially if and only if A is a subset of C sub K. So I'm kind of coming to a conclusion. One of the things you see about CSP is a, it's a beautiful paradigmatic problem with connection to complexity theory, to graph theory, to algebra, to logic. Um, and research is going strong. Uh, in particular, just a couple of days ago, we heard the Gettel Prize lecture and the Gettel Prize was given to three papers. And they look at this again at, at CSP, but now they look at the counting complexity version of the problem. For example, if you're looking at a homomorphism, you can ask how many homomorphism are there, compute the number of hom homomorphism, or there are even valued homomorphism, compute the total weight of all homomorphisms. And it turned out, in fact, that this was, this paper preceded the bulatov zuk result. They were able to collectively to establish a, a, a dichotomy of growing strength between these papers and their research in this area is still going, going very strong. To give some perspective on what I call logical algorithmics, I try to offer you a logical perspective on algorithm and complexity. And we saw that some beautiful theories come out of it, discretive complexity theory, multivariate complexity theory, dichotomy theorem for CSP. There is another aspect of logical algorithmic, which is model checking, where we are trying to prove algorithmically properties of programs, finite program or finitely represented programs, but that would take too much time to be able to do it in this rather short talk. I will conclude by this uh, observation. So many of you are familiar with the concept of volume A and volume B theory. So in 1990, uh, Van Leeuwen pro produced a handbook of theoretical computer science and it had two volume because it was just too big to fit in, in all in one volume. So for just purely logistical reasons, he said, I'll divide it into two volumes because it was just getting too hefty. And he wanted some themes to the two volumes. And the theme was uh, TCSA was algorithm and complexity and TCSB was more uh, logic and semantics. 
And so this gives rise now to the concept of TCSA and TCSP. Now here is a quote from one of the blogs by Odette Goldreich. The theory of computation aim at understanding the nature of computation and specifically the inherent possibilities and limitation of efficient computation. The theory of programming is concerned with the actual task of implementing computation, i.e. writing computers programs. So if you know Oded, then you know that Oded was never shy from provocative opinions. And in nutshell, he's telling us, if you do theory of computation with TCS, TCSA, you're a real theoretician, this is the real science, as opposed to the code monkeys, so to speak, who do TCSP. What I've hoped that I've convinced you here is that the theory of computation and theory of programming cannot really be separate because by studying also the, by here, by, by losing logic, a description of problems, we're getting insight on algorithms and complexity. The Knuth Prize is for outstanding contribution to the foundation of computer science. And I'm very, very grateful to the Knuth Prize Selection Committee for taking the broad view of theoretical computer science as covering the theory of, uh, as I said, of algorithms, programs, and systems. People, if you have been involved in awards, you also know that every award requires very hard work by someone to write a good nomination and people who would support it and write letter of, uh, letter of uh, support. Uh, and this, they're, they're usually an invisible part of the process, but I want to thank the people who did that. They deserve my thanks too. And at this point, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take questions if there are any questions.